Good afternoon or evening. It's evening. My name is Patrick. I'm the youth pastor here at Temple, and I am just grateful that you tuned in today for this uh, Wednesday evening. <clears throat> I'm going to be kind of bouncing around. Uh, well, you know what? I'm just going to get right to it. Let's let's uh, let's pray, and then we'll uh, we'll dive into what we need to talk about. All right, Father God. We're going to be tackling some difficult topics and not even getting into it and breaking them down. God, we're going to be looking at the hard questions and we're not going to break them apart. So God, give us the will afterwards to find the answers. God, as we learn today how and why it is important to seek the answers to these questions, please, God, give us a passion to find them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as I said in my prayer, you might have been able to pick up that we're going to be looking at some of the tougher questions in the Bible, and we're not going to answer those questions. In fact, we're going to give you the tools to answer them, to find the answers yourself, or to more accurately, seek those answers from He who provided them. So uh, I want to look at a couple of key scriptures. Um, the first one is... <clears throat> Let me see if I can do this right. The question of biblical inerrancy is easier to handle in today's society than the question of homosexuality and, it relate, and how it relates to the Bible. Is it a question of divine authority? Is it a question of... Uh, loving thy neighbor. This is one of those difficult questions. And how we answer these questions in our own minds, in our own hearts, and with our own relationship with God is just as crucial as how we answer those questions with others. So I want you to be, be uh, receptive to this as you can. Keep an open mind throughout this, this process, and hopefully uh, it won't take too much of your time, but it will uh, give you something that you can use for the rest of your life. All right? So first, diving in to the book of Romans uh, in chapter 1, uh, we're talking about God's uh, judgment of guilt for the, the, the Gentile world, that is, the world of the lost. Uh, Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, says here, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness, suppressing the truth. I'm sorry, I missed a line. Against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppressed the truth. Sorry about that. Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his Invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Pause right there for a moment. Paul is not mincing words here, is he? He's not saying that, well, the gospel didn't reach them, so they don't count. The fact is that the gospel has reached everyone at all times. The truth about our inadequacy before God is available. And that key truth requires us to submit to Him. Let's keep going now. Verse 21, For, they, for though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. I want you to think about that one. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. We're going to come back to it. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images representing mortal men, birds, four-footed animals, even reptiles. Verse 24, Therefore God delivered them over to the cravings of their hearts, to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves and each other. They exchanged 
the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served something created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. Continues to say this at verse 26. This is why God delivered them over to a degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The males in the same way also left natural relations with females and were inflamed with their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received their own person, in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their error. It is not easy to read these scriptures and witness to somebody who's struggling with same-sex attraction. It is not easy to surrender your heart and your will to God and then love those who are in the state of fallen disobedience that Paul's describing. It is not easy to reconcile a loving and merciful God with the lustful desires in our own hearts. It is not an easy question. But it is an important question. It's a question we as believers and we as human beings must ask and seek the answer for. Let me dive into another one. Uh, in the gospel, Peter asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus, all of them had a tradition that was guided from the, um, the Pharisees to forgive four times. What was going on is that forgiveness was brought in the law, that you, forgive, you should forgive your brother over and over again three times, it says. And the Pharisees said, well, we'll go one more and make it really good. And Peter said, I can make it even better and I can go. Seven, which of course is symbolism and numerology. But Jesus said, not even until you have forgiven your brother seven times, 70 times, which I'm sure Jesus was capable of saying five times fast, but he didn't, thankfully. He isn't speaking literally. He doesn't say, keep your account of your forgivenesses until you've reached 490, and then at that point, you can get angry with them. He's using that device, the 7 times 70, to say, continually forgive. How can we, as Christians who become, who want to become generous, but get taken advantage of, who want to give but are stolen from, how can we love, forgive, be merciful if we are continually punished? Once again, a crucially important question. And the answers are available. But we're not going to answer that today. In Genesis chapter 1, this is the next scripture, right? I'm not going to read from it because we all know the story. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the universe. And it's this amazing picture of God creating everything from nothing. Creation ex nihilo, from nothing, is the concept that is presented in Genesis. And there are some details that seem to conflict with material evidence in the world. And it's that conflict, let me rephrase that, that seeming conflict that can make people think that either the Bible isn't true or the evidence in the material world is falsely acquired or falsely interpreted or even not true. <clears throat> Again, 
an important question to look into. Why seven days of creation? Why not seven eons? Or maybe seven is a metaphor for seven time periods. Maybe there was a tremendous pause between the first and the third day. Or maybe time close to the earth continued moving even though the rest of the universe had stayed still. There's all kinds of different theories posited and evidences and proofs on one side and the other of the debate. Here is one of those important questions. And it's crucial that we don't forget to investigate the question. But this is one of those important questions that's important for a different reason than the first two. What about debates or discussions or arguments between the translations of the Bible? You'll have uh, people who say that the King James Version, the 1611, the real one, is the only real Bible. But then again, you'll hear things like the Holman Christian Standard is a more modern scholarly approach, or the NIV or the ESV has better interpretation of the historical verifiable evidence, or that divine inspiration only came in its original authorial language, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Why is the question of translation important? As you can see, these are some crucially difficult and important questions. How we answer them is the small potato. And like God says, if you are faithful in the little things, You'll be faithful in the big things. So I want to take a look at some of the little things, but also I want us to see the big things, the big picture for these questions, what we're really driving towards when we ask these questions. So let's dive in. Do you want to go reverse order? Let's go reverse order, deal with the easy stuff first. Yes, King James commissioned a Bible to be written in English, and it was significant. It was an amazing and gorgeous translation written, as predicted, and published in 1611. It was a translation from Latin and from Old English, a combination of those two copies of the Bible. And those are both, again, brilliant translations. But none of them are the original language. The language that the Bible was originally written in, and the secret is there isn't one. Let me explain that a little bit. We don't have a copy of the Bible written in its one original language because the Bible was written in three original languages, and the people writing it probably spoke more than one more probably more than three different languages, even at the time of their writing. If you look at the Gospels, you'll see men and women going about speaking Aramaic, reading Hebrew, and writing the Bible, the New Testament, in Greek. Why is this that we get stuck on the words as specifically and manuschatically as we can when it's gone from translation to translation to translation to translation, the truth is uncertain. Or at least it can seem that way sometimes. We can feel like maybe the Bible isn't as infallible or untrustable or unfailing I guess, as it could be. We could seem, it could seem to our eyes, a, a, a reason for doubt. But let me ask you this. Have you ever seen someone or know someone or heard of someone who's come to faith by reading their Bible? I do. I know several. 
myself included. And what version of the Bible were they reading? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're reading the Turkish Bible or the Chinese Bible, the Arabic Bible or the English Bible or the NIV or the CSB or the message. The truth will pour through the text. See, the Bible itself is not a magical book. It's not some strange uh, leather-bound Necronomicon found in a wizard's lair that if you were to read one of the pages, you'd be granted some divine power. But it is the key. That is, it's the record of what God has done to describe his attributes and demonstrate his character for human beings. No one Bible is the single most holy Bible or most unattainably perfect Bible. So to seek the answer of the ultimate or the perfect translation is to dive into a quest for truth, but the guidance is here. First, last, and primarily, do so in a state of prayer, with your mind and your heart surrendered to learning from God what He has to teach you instead of trying to find a flaw or reading it to have read it. Because, you know, it's the third day in my Bible reading plan for the start of the new year, and I just need to make sure I've read the third chapter in John or whatever. <clears throat> Checking a box because you read your Bible, or reading your Bible to check a box, is as useless or almost as useless as not reading your Bible. We as Christians should see, so be desperately and fervently after the truth of God that we not only enjoy reading our Bible, but we enjoy and desire to have more from it than simple words on paper can offer. We'll bring commentaries and notebooks and we'll bring uh, Greek and Hebrew lexicons if necessary. It's okay to dive deeper because God did layer the Bible with that depth. The deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the more amazing character and power you'll find in the characters of the story. Everything that's written is significant. And arguing over whether or not it says at Capernaum or in Capernaum is not nearly as crucial as arguing over whether or not the Bible is true. Setting aside the supposition that argument is good, it is. A connected series of statements intended to derive a proposition, argument is crucial to the development of our minds towards knowledge. And while, yes, knowledge alone puffs up, it is wisdom that God wants us to possess. One scholar wrote, wisdom is knowledge tempered by experience. Another said the beginning of wisdom. We can't begin to have wisdom without first having the knowledge of God. So how can we know God if we don't read our Bibles with the desire to go deeper and to get more from God? We must be so thirsty after the truth of God that we cannot do else but seek Him more fully and completely. Never replace the Holy Spirit told me. I'm sorry, never replace the Bible says with what the Holy Spirit told me. What that can quickly become is a pathway to heresy. The Bible should be held up and treated as good. 
And there are some Bibles that have been added to and taken away from that we need to be careful when reading. And if you'd like some additional resources about finding out which of those Bibles we should and shouldn't even consider reading, please contact us here at Temple. We're happy to dive into that with you. Why do we need to know the right translation, the right version of the Bible? Because it's a question of understanding where we can trust the words written. Where we can verify that what is written in those passages, in that pericope or in this pericope, is actually close to what was written by the authors. Okay, great. What was written by the authors may not be true. That's our next question, our third question, right? And it's a question of, is the Bible factual? Is the Bible reliable as a source of information? That, again, is a crucially difficult question. If we can't look at the Bible and say, God said it, the universe is this way, or God created it in this fashion, how can we rely on God saying, Jesus came to this earth and died for our sins? If we can't rely on the truth that God flooded the world, then how can we rely on the truth that God will save those who believe in him. That's why it's an important question. But diving into the answer to that question, you're looking at a question of biblical inerrancy. And anytime you investigate biblical inerrancy, you have to be mindful of one thing. What is this passage of scripture? What is whatever passage of scripture you're investigating, trying to say. Remembering that, yes, God said, let there be light, and check it out, guys, there was. That's a statement, a factual statement about historical events that occurred according to the Bible's narrative. You can take that to be a historical narrative because that's how that section of Scripture treats itself. But you cannot look at Proverbs and say the same thing. After all, the book of Proverbs says there is no God, doesn't it? Kind of. See, what I just did there was called eisegesis. Take a meaning from a piece of the Bible that doesn't have a full meaning, a full uh, sentence or full scope of the rest of the, the passage. Let me get more detail on that. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. Now, does that mean to you and me that there is no God? That the Bible said it? No. It's saying only the fool has the thought in their heart that there is no God. But God never forsakes knowledge. He says, be careful with knowledge, temper it with humility and wisdom. But you cannot ever give up the rational exploration of God's character. Discovering with thinking and feeling hearts and our whole self, everything we have, the absolute truth of God's promises and his attributes is the, 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 the key to understanding our walk as Christians. But if we can't look at the seven days of creation and decide for ourselves to trust God, we've missed the point of that story. 
Is the Bible literally and factually true? Parts of it are. Other parts are hypothetical stories, parables told within other stories. And it's sometimes very difficult to see those things for what they are. That's why we need to read the Bible with an open mind and an open heart, being willing to learn and to read and to see, but never ever take one passage alone on its own. Never take one sentence or one verse and say, this is what this verse means. Always look at the preceding and the following verses. I say preceding and wave my hand up here because that's where they are on the page above and, you know, the following or below. Um, now, coming to the question of forgiveness is a question of character. We talked first about struggling with translation, and that's a question of verifiability. Can we trust the Bible says what it should have said, as, that is to say, as the authors wrote it, does it say it today? Obviously, we can't perfectly trust it, but we can trust that the Holy Spirit will guide us to it through the Bible. Second question we dealt with, even though I presented them initially in, out of, in reverse order, the second question, is the Bible logistically and literally true? And the tough answer is sometimes. Meh. I would love to say it's more deliberate and careful than that, but the fact is that we have to be thinking people. What about the question of our behavior as it relates to people mistreating us? Now, there's tons of reference material for this in the Bible that says how to respond when somebody mistreats you, how to respond when somebody uh, takes advantage of you or swindles you or uh, steals from you. Not just in the New Testament, not just in the words of Jesus or Paul or Peter, but in the Old Testament. In fact, in the original five books, the Pentateuch. It tells us how to respond to thievery, how to respond to cruelty and malice. So when Jesus says, forgive your brother, seven times 70 times, the question that's being asked in ourselves isn't the question that we ask out loud. The real question is, Really? Like, do I have to? The real question is, okay, God, I hear you, but where's the exception? The question we don't want to admit asking is, when is it okay for me to not forgive this person for wronging me or stealing from me or hurting me? When is it okay to punish them for what they've done, for me to punish them? And you and I both already know the answer. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That means punishing the wrongdoer is entirely in the hands of God. And if we come to give nine loaves of bread out to the poor, and one person comes and steals eleven from us, and now we don't have any bread left, then we've got to forgive them. And we've got to continue getting and giving bread, even though that person may be there tomorrow to steal 11 more loaves. Over and over and over again. If you're struggling with this, please read uh, the book Serving Even When It Hurts. I don't remember who it's by, but it's a great book to help serve when people are taking advantage of you, when you have nothing left to give. Continue to give. The real question of forgiveness is 
that we're struggling with the ability to continue to forgive. Okay, one time. I can forgive somebody one time. Now, the question of homosexuality. I told you guys I am not going to answer this question in any way other than what it says. See, it doesn't say, when, when Paul wrote this, it doesn't say that those uh, people who were uh, doing the thing were evil, but instead it says that they were doing idolatrous or lustful acts. It doesn't say that they're unsavable. In fact, it was Paul's mission to go to the Gentile world that he's describing and to bring the gospel to them. It doesn't say that they are all condemned to go to hell. In fact, it says in the same book, if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart, that is, you say and you do, then you will be saved. So, to have a posture of hatred for a sinner or disdain for a lifestyle is to misunderstand the previous question, is to think you have an exception for forgiveness. And like we just talked about, those exceptions cannot be our excuse to apply it. You see, the, the rational part of our brains wants to serve God. It needs to. But it is used to serving our flesh. So we've got to bring our minds under control. Now that is a crucial portion of the lesson. See, guarding your heart, disciplining your mind, is the key to understanding how God wants us to ask these questions. Being intentional with our thoughts and consciously saying, to ourselves, before God. All right, Patrick, it's time for you to study the Bible. I mean, you, you can substitute your own head name, right? Whatever you call yourself in your head. I usually actually call myself Splat. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's time for us to study the Bible. So let's see what God has to say to us today. And if it says, if I turn my Bible open and it says, Patrick, Quit cutting your hair so short. I, I, I will grant you, my Bible has never said my name, but I don't know. I have read it a couple dozen times, so I'm pretty sure it doesn't, but I could be wrong. <coughs> I've read several translations, none of them say Patrick, that I've found. But they can still tell me things. God can still speak to me through them. And usually it's not stuff about my hair. Oh, there are a few passages, aren't there? The question is, is God your authority? Have you believed with your heart? And if God is your authority, then the Bible is your message from your authority. If you're at work, and your boss had to go. Maybe he left to go to a conference for bosses who work at the same place you work. And your boss left a note. And the note had a list of all the things that your boss was expecting you to do while they were gone. Do you think that note would be, like it would be a good idea for you just to burn the note and never read it? Throw it away and ignore it? In fact, if you wanted to be a good employee, you'd do those. If you wanted to be a great employee, you'd do those and then some. You'd go above and beyond, right? The same is true here. I love the acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth for the Bible. I mean, it's not actually what the Bible's intended to do, but it's pretty 
apt, isn't it? Reading our Bibles as though they are a message from the ultimate authority on our lives changes how we read the Bible and it changes how we look at God because we stop seeing, all right, if these are the rules and the structures of the universe that God made, fine, maybe I can find an exception or a loophole or a reason to do it my way. And we instead see the painful reality of our sin and the glorious mercy and grace of our God who died for us. Once you see that, there aren't any restrictions, there aren't any punishments or failings on that side of the cross. There are simply opportunities to grow and happy little accidents. Bob Ross style, right? If we can't read our Bible with the intent to gather from God His will to discern from Him what we need to know from Him, about Him, for His will, then we cannot be God's people. Without God's Word, we are not His people. Without Jesus... John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Without Jesus, also God's Word, we're nothing. We're just as condemned as the men and women in Romans chapter 1 that Paul is talking about. If you have nothing left but these questions, I beg you, please seek the answers to these questions. But do so under the reality, the knowledge of the truth that God cares. Obviously that He exists, and above and beyond all else, that God is good. And as you do that, you'll discover His goodness around you. His record of it in the Bible you won't see the weird things happening in the Bible as weird anymore. You'll see them as miraculous, amazing, powerful, heartbreaking, important. Asking the questions is part of our instructions to being a Christian. Jesus said, ask, and you will be told. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened for you. It's also written, you have not, because you ask not. You don't have it, because you don't ask for it, right? And it's said also, that if God cares for the birds and the bees, how much more so does He care for us? If a bad father can still provide food for their children, how much more so your heavenly Father can provide for you? Trust Him. Seek Him. Ask after Him. And never, ever, ever do so alone. Yes, get to your quiet place. But when you're in your quiet place, all alone with the door shut, ask, and God will provide you His Holy Spirit to guide you and move you. When you cannot be in your quiet place anymore, come to a fellowship of believers, whether in person or online, and ask these questions. Seek the answers. Knock on pastor's doors until they go, what? Fine, I'll tell you what it says in Jude. The truth is available to us and we need only to seek it. To chase after it with all of our everything and if there's nothing greater, I mean, the fact is that there isn't anything greater than His truth. 
you can see that, then you will see how little everything else matters in comparison. So as you uh, go about your day, the rest of your day, well, I guess there's not much left of it now. It's Wednesday night, right? Um, as you go about the rest of your week, uh, please be seeking opportunities to hear from God. Read your Bible. Trust your Bible. But also ask these questions to God, of God, about God, and about yourselves. And then when you ask the questions, think about also what you're actually asking. Find the answers. Ask someone else. We're here to help you. Let's pray. Father God, I praise you and thank you that you have been present to, uh, to guide me and to aid me in br bringing this message. God, I pray that you bless the hearts and the minds of those who've heard it and by just giving them a passion to ask the difficult questions of themselves and of you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.